All right, good morning, guys. Welcome to Sunday at the Culinary Tent at the 2023 Tucson Festival of Books. Uh, we had a great first day at the festival, and I'm looking forward to a continued success here on Sunday with an amazing lineup of authors, and I will get to our superstar kicking off Sunday here in a second. Um, first, I have to take care of a little bit of book bookkeeping. So I know what you're all wondering is where can you buy Mariana's book? It's at the U of A bookstore um, in the student union. It's also sold at the main book selling tent um, just over here east on the mall. You'll also find it just maybe 50 yards down the road here uh, where she's book signing after the demonstration. Um, so you walk down next to that bookmobile van, you'll see a big orange balloon and an information booth. Her book will be located there as well as the other authors uh, demoing later today. Uh, we would not have the success of the culinary tent were it not for the support of Arizona Appliance and Home. They uh, bring this beautiful mobile kitchen in for us to use every year and it gives us a live gas range and oven and refrigerator and it's like cooking in a commercial kitchen and it really just brings the, the whole experience across the line. More importantly, we could not have the culinary tent without Pima Community College Culinary Arts Program. They uh, do all the hard grunt work. They prep all the food. They hand wash the dishes by hand in buckets back here in the back. Um, and they spend all week and all weekend preparing uh, to make our chef author's life very easy. So if we could give a huge round of applause for Pima Culinary Arts Program. Without further ado, it is my great pleasure to introduce to you Mariana Nuno Ruiz. Mariana was born and raised in Guadalajara, Jalisco, Mexico. In her early career, she was an architect, and she later received a culinary arts degree. She and her husband, Ian, co-created the award-winning blog, Yes, More Please, and today develop recipes for national and local brands. Mariana and Ian's work have appeared in the Huff Post, Food 52, The Kitchen, Country Living, The Today Show, and many other outlets. Dining with the Dead is Mariana's first cookbook and a true deep dive into the food, culture, and traditions surrounding the Day of the Dead. So let's give it up for Mariana. Thank you very much, Jennifer. And first of all, I'm very grateful to be here and thank you for the Tucson Book Festival for inviting us. So I'm so glad and excited that you guys are here. Um, I want to share uh, my love for frijolitos, for beans. Um, our book is about a journey through Mexico through Dia de Muertos and the history, origins, and the recipes that people in Mexico, we cook you know, traditional recipes during those celebrations. Um, I chose these recipes because those are the ones that I would like to come back, you know, from the afterlife to enjoy every year. <laughs> every year my altar, or if my family would set up an altar, I would love to see frijolitos de la olla, salsita de molcajete, and refried beans. So I hope you uh, you like the recipes, and I just they're very easy and. You know, these are recipes that you can make all year round um, if you embrace the, the bean love, as I do. <laughs> um, but first, I would like to start with my favorite salsa. And this salsa is the first one I learned to make on a molcajete. Do you guys know what a molcajete is? Yes? Okay, excellent. So this is stone vessel that usually in Mexico are made out of a volcanic stone. And um, why? Because the volcanic stone has certain minerals and salts that when you grind the chiles, the garlic, um, anything you grind in it, it acquires a certain minerality and flavor that is absolutely delicious. So if you like to invest in one of these, I would suggest you do, please. And it's very easy to cure them. You're just gonna put some rice and garlic and sea salt and grind it to get all the porous and the little dust from when they make it and keep grinding and grinding maybe two or three times until the rice comes out white and uh, then your mocha gets is ready. Um, one of the rules or let's say the, the best things since this surface is very porous when you're making your salsa you need to wet the whole mocajete. 
like either you put it under water or or under a faucet. Uh, here, I just put some water. But <laughs> um, the best place is that. Why? Because the molcajete again is so porous. So you want the water in, so the juices of your tomatoes are not uh, soaked into the stone. So then, the ingredients that I'm using today is garlic, sea salt, some um, roasted tomatoes. Uh, usually I use Roma, but these round ones will work too, whatever is best in season or, you know, the redder, the better. <laughs> it has more flavor. And then the chiles that I use is chile de arbol de yagualica. Chile de arbol, I'm from Jalisco, and chile de arbol is this long, long, Chiles. These ones I grew myself, <laughs> believe it or not, because I couldn't find the right type in Austin. So they're very easy to grow, and they have a smoky, piquant flavor. They're they're very hot, so watch out. Let's start with one or two, and then you grow. And the combination that I like, or that my grandma taught me, was the um, chile cascabel. And this is like a type of cherry. Chile, when it's fresh, it's red and then it's dry, you know, dry in the sun. And you can hear them, I don't know. <laughs> yes, um, and it comes very different size, and it made this little, like a pumpkin, you know, like a Halloween pumpkin uh, shape. And be careful because some of them are, are very confusing. Sometimes you see these ones, but these ones are like a Christmas light bulb. And these ones are Catarina pepper, so that's a different chili. And it's super spicy. So anyway, so we're going to start by uh, char these two. I'm going to start just with two. In a cast iron pan, or it could be a comal preference. And then the cascabel, I'm just gonna remove the little stem, um, but leave the seeds, because the seeds impart flavor. So I'm just gonna put the right here. And as you can see, um, I already started my tomatoes. Let's see if I can. And that's what you want. You want charred, that charred is flavor. It's not burnt, it adds. All, all these smoky and um, background notes into the salsa. And Mariana, you didn't put any oil or anything into that pan. In the, well, <laughs> in mine, my cast iron or my comal is already seasoned. Okay. Here, I did a little bit of um, oil just to, I, I, I never cook in this one. <laughs> but yes, you can do the same. And every time you season your cast iron pans, you know, never wash them with soap. Always just take a little either lard or your cooking oil of preference and wipe them with them every time you, you know, use them. So you see, these chiles de arbol, they cook really fast. So you have to keep an eye on them. Um, the same with the cascabel. We just want them to give them a little color, but not to let them super uh, Chart. It's just like a mahogany color, like a deep mahogany color. And uh, if they go a little farther, they might get a little bitter on your salsa. So I'm going to transfer. And for those of you that you can't quite see in the mirror, um, that tilting mirror only kind of adjusts for half the audience, so it might be easier to come up to a closer seat. Um, and I'm going to try to get all the seeds. Maybe this is not a very good tool, but maybe this one. Because you want to get, like I said, those seeds are very key to the flavor of the salsa too. And it's not very spicy. Those chiles cascabel are really uh, smoky, but it has a good, like a, almost like a cherry flavor. It has some sweetness to it. Um, and the tomatoes are ready. This took maybe like what, I don't know, like five, seven minutes, right? In the cast iron, medium heat, because you want them to cook through. Um, 
and charred. If you put them on high, then you get the char, but then they're still, you know, raw inside. So we're gonna put like two garlics. Um, oopsie. Uh, on that. And again, garlic you can adjust to your taste. You can have lots of garlic or little garlic. I like personally um, a small amount. I don't want to overpower. I, for me, what I learned in Mexican food, you know, cooking with my grandma, sometimes less is more. I mean, it doesn't mean that it would lose flavor. It's just like a, it gives this aroma, this depth, but it's not like overpowering in your face. So then the first thing always when making a salsa no molcajete is to put the garlic and sea salt. <coughs> Here we have kosher sal, which is okay. I always use uh, sea salt, sal de mar de colima. I love that sal, it has a great flavor. So then this is called la mano del molcajete o tejolote. I mean, whatever is your preference. And the way to do it or hold it, sometimes even, like here, I've used it so many times that it has a dent already and it adapts to my hand. But there's some that has like a, a shape, like a, more like a handle, like double handle. I like these little ones. Um, and you can start by just pressing it all around. And the salt helps a lot to, you know, to dissolve and the garlic and kind of also cooks the garlic a little bit, you know? So you, what I'm doing, I'm gonna try to do it that way so you guys do it. It's rubbing it, rubbing it, rubbing it, rubbing it. And that will make it like a paste that permeates all the salt. Once that you have that, you add the chiles and I like to just to break them a little bit before, so it's not so hard. And then I'll another pinch of salt. Don't worry, it's not a lot of salt. I mean, it's, you, you, you calculate yourself. And also the salsa needs to be flavorful. It needs to be a little more salty than usual because it's gonna go, go on top of a taco, a huevito, or an egg. Yes, and the same with this, the chiles. Um, you have to rub it all around um, and to make sure that these seeds are like very smashed and that's something that is different well that I feel is different from if you use like a food processor or a hand blender because the hand blender will kind of like a ch -ch -ch chop but it's not rubbing like a really make a paste and that seeds flavor the salsa really deliciously so once that you have it, salsa molcajeta is always a little choppy, it, and we call it martajada, meaning that it has like this texture, it's not completely evenly pureed. Also, you can make it totally pureed, but the nuances <laughs> that the salsa martajada has is absolutely delicious because you have like pieces of tomato, chile, the salt, I mean, it's really, really, I mean, it complements really well. And then after this, oh, oops, the cascabel. And all the seeds. Oui, come here. <laughs> if you feel that it's getting the paste too, let's say a little too dry, you can add a little bit of water to help. So this salsa is my first salsa ever when my grandma, Margarita, my dad's mom, uh, taught me how to drive it. <laughs> you know, she held my hand and said, okay, Mariana, put this here and this is gonna this is the way you have to rub it. I didn't do too well the first time. <laughs> I was kind of nervous. But uh, um, then I just, by looking at her and the, the advice that she gave me, 
that will be helped. So then you can put one, the tomatoes. See, ooh, they're smoky. Um, and one at a time. So you can do your prefer preference, like more or less. They're gonna fit. Yes, they will. And you see, I'm just pressing, and as I press, I rub the stone, and that's what the minerality of the stone works out in the salsa. And the last piece. Just with a wood spoon or you know uh, just a serving spoon I will scrape all the sides to get all the chili paste that was there and at this point you can decide either you want it this chunky that will be great for like some totofos or tacos because you don't want to water down your taquito um, or even if you want to make or use this sauce for some huevos rancheros delicious <laughs> and if you use it for well rancheros, I will recommend you to add maybe another two tablespoons or more water because you will want it to cook your eggs in oil, right? So it's up, and then on the same pan, just put this salsa and it will mingle and then just top the eggs with it. It's fantastic. <laughs> it's very good. And also at this point, you can try if, um, uh, try for salt, always rectify, right? Like if you do a little bit. Mm, no, it's fine, maybe, you know. <laughs> and, and that's about it, that's your salsita and molcajete. <laughs> um, <laughs> so now the, the next, any questions for the end, right? Yeah, I think let's save the questions for the end, um, just so we can kind of stay on task. Miriam's got quite a few recipes to demo. Okay, so next favorite thing would be beans. I'm a bean lover. I'm totally. My mom, <laughs> when my brother and I were little, my mom would leave us bottles of bean broth. <laughs> Probably would have been the... We were the cloudiest babies, but you know, we were really nutritious because Mexicans, we believe that all the nutritious is in the caldo or in the broth, in the soup and all that, right? So the same with beans. Have you guys ever made um, dry beans or cooked beans from dry? Yes? I love that. I mean, I have this fantastic, run into this fantastic company called Rancho Gordo. I don't know if you have heard of it. Um, and they have amazing varieties of beans, and uh, Steve Sando is kind of like a bringing back some heirloom beans and working with farmers in Mexico to bring those beans alive again. And that's a fantastic, you know, um, way to revive the bean culture. <laughs> but um, the from the from the place that I am from in Jalisco, beans are typically flor de mayo or mayo coba is a yellow light bean or pintos that's like the norm in other regions they use more like black beans or stuff like that my beans and i have a whole chapter in the book about, about it because, because well i mean i really like it but, I mean, <laughs> but it's a um, I, I i kind of let you know all my all the ways I cook beans. You know, for example, I, I don't soak them. If I know that there is a good source, 
I don't soak them. They don't need to soak, and they cook beautifully, and they don't become like all you know mushy or overly cooked. Um, I use very when I use when I cook beans on the pot. Um, I just put a little herbs, one chili, garlic, and onion. And depending on your flavor, I mean, if you like a pasote, you can put a pasote. If you like cilantro, you can add cilantro. Um, basically, that's it. I mean, it's just making the beans shine. All the flavor of the bean comes out. And it's very easy. You just put them in the pot, enough water, maybe like a three fingers above the level of the beans, um, a chunk of onion, maybe like around this side. If it's like a pound or two pounds, I usually cook more than, I cook like four pounds. But, <laughs> uh, but I like to make beansicles. I mean, I like to cook a lot of beans. It's just my husband and I, but then I just freeze them in containers and then I just use them as I go, you know, so I don't cook it so often or so. But um, anyway, so you just put them in a pot with three fingers above the level of the beans with water onion, your favorite herb. In this case, we use um, a serrano. And what I do is uh, I poke it just with the knife all around to liberate all the flavors as it cooks. Or if you can use even a cascabel, if you want something smoky, you can use a guajillo. The other one I like is with a morita. Chile morita is a small but mighty chili. I mean, it has been smoked and dry. So if you add just one of those, it gives a spicy, a little bit of pepperiness, but also smokiness. It's unbelievable one chili one can do for your beans. <laughs> so this is uh, another recipe on the book, like I said, and um, this will be exactly my dead row meal. <laughs> Um, if they say, Mariana, what is your last desire uh, in this earth? I'm like, well, my last meal will be frijolitos de la olla, like this. And once that you cook them, um, the way I serve them, if we have a bowl, Angela, I think a bowl to serve them. Um, Angela cooked these beans for us very beautifully. Um, also, one another important thing um, is that uh, invest on a clay pot, a good clay pot. Why? Because also that's another flavor that is given. You know, and like you're gonna cook the beans anyway, correct? So why not use a vessel that is gonna impart flavor into the beans, correct? And that's the easiest way because you don't even have to chop anything or anything. So. Um, if you can see them, right here, there's the pieces of onion, the, the chili has already, you know, like a dissolved. Um, the garlic, I don't even see it because the garlic becomes all like a pasty and flavors the broth. And at the same time, you see the broth is a little cloudy. So that's another preference. In Mexico, people like it clear and they don't put anything. They just put the onion and take it out. And you have a very beautiful licorice broth. But sometimes if you cook them for a little longer, you can smash them a little bit on the edge or find those pieces of garlic or onion and mash them against the, the pot. And then you get this cloudy, kind of like a with different consistency broth. And that's also delicious. So that's upon you. A pot of beans for like a two pounds, it takes around an hour, an hour and a half. And what you do is, what you want to do is like bring them to a boil, maybe leave them for two, three minutes on hard boil, and then turn it all the way down, with a very, very slow simmering with the lid agar, just like this. And leave them there. Don't Maybe in half an hour, come back. And what you do is you mix them from the edges and up. So then you don't destroy your beans, you know, they don't become all mush. So if you do the edges and the center, you kind of like a, make them all mingle, and that'd be great. 
and that's it. I mean, whenever you see the beans that they start to peel off, like this, like the skins, they're ready, and you can try one. Mm. <laughs> they're ready. You, you will taste them, it's creamy. Mm. It doesn't have this like a graininess, it's totally creamy, it's so in your hands and your mouth, and they're ready. And that's a whole meal, because they have lots of protein, um, you accompany with tortillas or quesadillas, they can be like a, a strong meal of the day, or just, you know, like a side dish. There's many, many things. So this is like a plate of edible, not for like a serving plate, like if you were going to eat meat, that's all. Well, let's imagine that this is like a beautiful clay plate. <laughs> Um, that's right. No, it's fine. Um, so the way I will serve them, just like in the book, and again, people like, it's, your, it's up to your preference. If you want um, more broth or drier, I like a lot of broth. Um, but basically, serve them for like this, maybe two or three labels. The herbs, now you can add them maybe at the last 20 minutes. And the same, when you, you never cook your beans with, um, with the salt at the beginning. The salt is always at the end. Why? Because you know your beans will harden and they will never cook. I mean, you can have the pot running and never. So always, when you try your beans, oh, they're ready. Turn up the pot, put the salt, mix them the way around and leave them. The salt will dissolve, the beans will soak up those juices and the salt and that's it. Um, so for these, I like to serve them just frijolitos de la olla with a little bit of, oh, you don't have a pichorita, I know, I'll borrow this one, pardon me, <laughs> um, with a little bit of chopped onion, cilantro, you can put a little bit of uh, diced tomato. It's kind of like a pico de gallo, but on the pico de gallo, you basically are putting like a lime juice or a little oil, right? And I don't like to add those things, although you can, but I mean, I just like just fresh chop and a little avocado will be great. Crema, mexicana, a little quesito, quesito fresco. And, ah, no, you're real. <laughs> and, uh, and some tortillas. Like homemade tortillas, heavily, heavily. And the book also walks you through how to make masa. If you're like super wanna be at it, you can learn how to make masa from fresh mixed tamal, how to make your tamal. Uh, or you can make it fresh tortillas from Mazarina, you know, the Maseca or any other brand. Um, I also, the book uh, has a sourcing of ingredients on the back, so you can order online if it's easier for you. And um, there's another company, it's called Macienda, and they're bringing uh, some Maseca that is from Erlu corn from Oaxaca and other regions of Mexico. So that would be a good, you know, uh, option if you don't want to buy the supermarket or you want to be a little above level supermarket. <laughs> um, but that's it. I mean, basically, uh, you can serve them like that. And of course, last but not least, una super cucharadita de salsita. <laughs> and that's delicious. You know, like, that's it. So. <laughs> Next, uh, now you would say, well, all that work for just a plate of beans? Well, these beans are extremely versatile. And the same, in the same chapter, with these, these, these cooked beans, you can make wonders. So <laughs> from these, you can make refried, refried beans. And refried beans have many nuances. You can put beans uh, just by itself, or with chorizo, or even with pieces of corn. <laughs> you know, like refried beans, baked with chorizo, 
and make it a whole dish, tacos dorados. I have uh, this amazing sopa tarasca. It's like a creamy soup made with beans and a little basilla and ancho. Um, and it's served with little tortillitas, kind of as a manner of tortilla soup, but it's like a creamy porridge of beans. And this is very typical for Michoacán. Uh, see, Michoacán, the area of Pascuero. Uh, and then another thing you can make with beans is enfrijoladas. And I don't know if you guys, it's kind of like the cousin of enchiladas, but instead of using uh, a chili paste or green tomatillos, you make the uh, you make this sauce with beans. And on the book, in the book, every step, you know, that's when we are we going to put all, all the steps. Just sauteing some of the chiles, or again of your preference. I use pasilla. You can use guajillo, whatever is your preference. And then a layer of those beans, like a cup, a cup and a half, and onion, garlic, aromatics, and then you puree it, and then you have your sauce, and make delicious enfricoladas. <laughs> yes, enfricoladas. Um, so now, the, um, the next thing I'd like to show you is how to make some proper refried beans. Well, in my, <laughs> in my world. <laughs> Like uh, I know there's many, many recipes, and each family makes them their own, and some people put more lard and less lard. Honestly, in my family, we use for every day some safflower oil or some cooking oil, and my grandma will use lard only for uh, like birthdays or a special occasion like Christmas or any special celebration, then we'll have, but for every day, we we'll, we'll for lard. But since today is a special celebration, <laughs> so I'm using lard. <laughs> so, uh, I'm gonna. The key is also again the best lard you can find. Um, there's some leaf lard that comes from the kidneys of the uh, of the pork, and that lard is very pristine. It's actually very healthy for you, uh, and imparts good flavor in the beans but if you don't want any saturated fats or, you know, or not a strong flavor. Also there's the, the, the lard that contains all the little bits of the, of the pork, you know, when they fry the skin of the pork and all the parts, that's where it renders the best flavor, like in Michoacán. Uh -huh. um, so that's another type. And then they call asiento, where all that lard, all those little bits of the skin, of the little parts, fall down, you know, the, they go to the bottom, and that's asiento, and that's like incredible, because it's having like a little pieces of morsels of bacon on the lard. There's even, like for example, in Oaxaca, gorditas de asiento, so it's like a little flatter tortilla, and then they smash the edges, and put that asiento on top, and it bubbles a little bit in the comal, and it's heavily, heavily. But well, the, the key to make these refried beans, or at least the way I make them, is to heat up your lard like a screaming hat. And when I say screaming hat, it's like you can see the shimmering on the, on the pan. And I like to use a cast iron pan because, you know, the, it keeps the heat, it retains the heat. Um, it's a very good if you have a clay pot, also you can do that. Um, and then, so you see that shimmering? That's what you want. And even a little smoky, like that's a good, that's a good point. So then, Be careful here because you don't want to use um, a wet spoon because it will splatter. And be very careful always to to put the things like against you, not towards you. So here, like I'm gonna put them against me. You see, so you don't have all those things jumping at you. So onion, half an onion, 
chop very thank you este, chop, have an onion chop and you're gonna cook it until well well translucent even a little beyond translucent you want some color why again because that will give flavor and a little pinch of salt it will help to dehydrate the onion and cook faster the liquid let me adjust the heat okay um, at this point also if you you can put a little chile you know like a what is the chile that I think it was yes put a little chile here to give flavor to the oil too and it could be a chile de arbol or it could be a serrano jalapeño the chile huero the the yellow peppers any kind of chile you prefer that's the whole point that making your own make your own recipe try it this way if you don't like it you can change it right it's all about the cooking situation so if you see well you know it's too far away but um, the onions will start to caramelize, have a little brown color on, on the edges, and that's what you want. You can go a little farther um, for time restrictions. I don't know what time. We have about 20 minutes. Okay, for time restriction, I'm just gonna, you know, stop at this point. You let's imagine that this chile is already blistered and ready. So I will set it aside because we don't want to smash it. And at this point, you're gonna put your frijolitos. And again, just go away and against you. So you don't have a being patient. <laughs> And you see, I don't know how many pounds of beans was this, uh, two pounds. It, it's like the greatest, more abundant meal that you will ever make. I mean, endless. So, endless possibilities. So you kind of like a, put enough beans, not a lot of the broth, because you want them refried. So basically they're gonna fry it right now as, as beans, as whole beans. And then we're gonna smash them. Um, I have two tools of preference. Uh, this is called machacadora, and it's made of wood. It was a tool that was brought by the French to the areas of Michoacan and Jalisco, like the south, and it matches the beans absolutely gorgeous. I mean, if you want, if you want just like a little, like to be the perfect smooth beans, use the machacadora. But if you want those beans that have a little texture, you know, like the skins are not all dissolved, use one of these bean mashers or potato mashers, I guess it's I like the ones that has the little holes because uh, it allows to, uh, you know, to better smash. So now the juices are almost gone, if you can see. And that's, now's the time to start mashing. Always use a little uh, towel to hold the cast iron because it really makes it hot, very hot. So basically just mash it. You can just go at it. <laughs> and um, at this point, like again, you can just make it as little as a smash, as much uh, 